Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor William Baker, who is a professor and journalist in residence at Fordham University in New York. He is also a professor of media and entertainment at IESC Business School in Barcelona, Spain, and president emeritus of WNET 13, New York's public television station. Professor Baker is a recipient of seven Emmy Awards, two Columbia DuPont Journalism Awards, and honored in 2016 by the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center for his work in the performing arts. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Really nice to be here and uh, talk to you. Uh, I, I know that you have, a, you have a book that came out recently, and we'll get to that. But I want to start with one of your previous books. Uh, I think it came out in 2016, uh, entitled The World is a Stage how performing artists can make a living while still doing what they love. Um, I don't know a lot about performing arts, Bill, but I would love to hear, um, you know, what what uh, what you explore there. And I think you had a co-author on that book as well, right? Right. I had actually two co-authors, uh, uh, one Evan Leatherwood, who worked with me and has, was kind of my, is uh, was at the time, uh, my kind of resident genius. He was one of the scholars, a Slifka scholar who worked for me. And then my old, actually my oldest friend, I'm in my 70s and he's been a friend since uh, the second grade. So, uh, you know, o- over 70 years. And uh, and he is a um, uh, he owned an a engineering company in California. He has a PhD from Case Western Reserve in uh, mechanical engineering. Owned, owned a a uh, mechanical engineering design company, and then uh, became a professor of economics. Later, got a degree in economics at one of the uh, California universities. He lives in in uh, uh, in San Francisco. At any rate, I had him do the economics uh, part of it because he's uh, a lot smarter than I am. Uh, the purpose of the book is called The World's Your Stage, and it's for performing artists. It was kind of interesting. Yeah. I was asked, oh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, by uh, Dr. Joseph Polisi, who was the president of Juilliard, because I had told him, I said, Joe, I'm teaching all these courses at colleges all over, you know, fairly distinct distinguished colleges, Harvard and, and, uh, and uh, my old school, I would never taught at Case, but, you know, a number of schools so, uh, yeah. and uh, Columbia. And I said, I've never taught at Juilliard. He said, well, why don't you teach? So I, <laughs> I started teaching uh, a course at Juilliard. Now, I'm not a performing artist, but I know the business very well because um, uh, we, when I was president of public TV uh, in New York, we were the biggest uh, producers of serious performing arts programming in uh, in America. So we knew the people, we knew the industry, I knew how complicated it was and what many of the pitfalls are, which are many. Uh, and here I was uh, suddenly teaching a course at Juilliard about the business. And I was also asked by uh, Father McShane, who is the president of uh, 
Fordham, he said, wouldn't it be great if we combined with Juilliard and uh, you did a course on that on the subject of the business of the performing arts? And I said, oh, yeah, that'll be easy. I should be able to do that with my eyes closed. Well, turns out that's really, really difficult. It's a very complicated industry and it's a very hard industry. And uh, the, my students, uh, my Juilliard students, were, of course, among the very finest performers in the world. Happens that Juilliard is the hardest school in America to get into. And you don't apply to, you don't apply to Juilliard um, if you're, uh, you know, you're not really good in the first place. And it's only got a 1% acceptance rate at any rate. So arguably, my students, when they were graduating, I had graduate and undergraduate students, were, you know, it, it, at whatever instrument or or a uh, performing skill they might have, singing, dancing, uh, acting, may be uh, the best in the world, you know, or among the best in the world. Yeah. And then, but what happens? Well, getting a job in a, in a profession where, you know, let's, let's say you, you want a job in a symphony orchestra. You may be the, among the best in the world, but every year there are 5,000 people coming out of conservatories in, uh, in the world and 300 jobs in major orchestras. So no matter how good you are, your chances are very remote. So basically what we uh, did is this book that showed the economics and it also showed, hey, if you're going to really make it, chances are you're not going to, I mean, God bless you if you do, but the chances are remote that you're going to get hired by somebody like the Cleveland Orchestra or something yeah. uh, uh, or uh, or the New York uh, 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 New York Phil uh, or, or some uh, major opera company. What you're going to have to do is be become an entrepreneur. Well, that's entire, you're gonna, that means you're going to be running a business. You're going to be promoting. You're going to have to figure out a new way to do something where somebody's going to come and pay for your, pay for what you have to offer. These are skills that are not in your, uh, not likely to be in your uh, uh, portfolio. So we're going to have to teach you all that stuff. And, uh, and uh, so it was really a challenge. One, it was a challenge to understand this subject in general. Uh, number two, and we had the finest people in in the profession also come because we were at Juilliard and we were right at Lincoln Center uh, where they so we had Peter Gelb, head of the Metropolitan Opera. Um, uh, we had um, Rachel Moore, who was the um, who was the at that time the head of the ABT, a former ballet dancer herself. Then, then wound up becoming broke her ankle, became head of the uh, uh, American Ballet Theater, and then after that, uh, and then uh, by the way, now is running uh, the Music Center of Los Angeles, which is the second or third biggest performing arts center in America, and uh, so it, it was it was interesting, but very very, I'd say more than anything, heartbreaking. You see these really brilliant people, and one of my students was was a brilliant concert pianist. He was he got his masters at uh, at Juilliard. Yeah. And uh, and um, and he performed uh, everywhere including Carnegie Hall. And uh, he finally said this is impossible. Hmm. And he's right now selling uh, equities for a company. And <laughs> so he's he's in this he's a stockbroker in effect, not a stockbroker, but a little bit higher level than that. Has yeah. no background in finance, but he has a charming personality and a grand piano in his office, and <laughs> uh, and somehow has and and then see that's it. He uh, the the people that hired him, which was a major firm in New York, they said we know all about you know the financial models and all that stuff. We just want we just want somebody who is a. Uh, uh, a receptor who can attract clients that have high levels of wealth. And he started an organization of board members of these big performing arts institutions who are all pretty much rich people. And, uh, and they would get together and then, you know, kind of they'd slip in uh, their sales pitch in the middle of that. So yeah, it's pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, I mean, the economics of this is so challenging, as you say. It's so skewed that you know that the ones that make it um do really well but the probability of making it is so low i would imagine it's similar to you know yeah the, the sports leagues right um you know playing the nba or something along those lines 
uh, which is significantly different from a conventional career like engineering or medicine or something Correct. like that. Correct, yes. So that is where the challenge is. And, um, and you know, I don't know how one would manage it uh, at the individual level, uh, but perhaps some sort of portfolio uh, type management might be needed. I don't know if, if it is mechanistically possible. I was also looking at the numbers you had, you know, in terms of the economics of the Metropolitan Opera, and their budget is 325 million, and you say they often operate at a loss. Yes. So even those institutions are having a hard time. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, now even more than ever, um, what is happening, uh, because of course, there's nobody in the seats at the places. Uh, now they've cut all of their costs, but still the overhead is massive. massive. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera is the, is the biggest performing arts organization in America. Uh, the second or third biggest, which is Cirque du Soleil, yeah. Uh, just went bankrupt. Uh, so, um, you know, you're headed for trouble. You know, you've got other uh, big organizations. That, you know, I don't know what's happening. You know, are, there's some ar ar uh, arguably say the Cleveland Orchestra might be the best orchestra in America. How they're, how they're going to keep going during this when you can't. But it might be a year before you can have people in your audience. You just, it's all about development right now. That is fundraising, raising money. That's what it's all about, trying to keep the arts alive. No government support generally. And you think also about, you know, forget, you know, even the performing arts. Think about the other arts, the art museums. The, I mean, they're all, they're all in really serious trouble. And rich people, even though they're phenomenally generous, many of them, and have given hundreds of millions of dollars, it's not enough to plug the hole. You know, the, the, uh, the number of employees at a place like, say, the Metropolitan Museum of Art is probably 2,000 or more. You know, yeah. the same, same at Lincoln Center, same at Music Center for Los Angeles. What is the Music Center for Los Angeles going to do? They have 2,000 employees. Now, you probably can lay off, uh, you know, 1,000 of them, but, right. you know, which is heartbreaking. But you still are going to have all that plus the general overhead. you got to keep the lights going and the heat and air conditioning running, you know, so it's, it's really a job. Yeah, it is, it is scary. Uh, and, and these are modalities that you can really, you know, the, the remote thing that we are going into in education and another uh, business type uh, work, this is not something that, that is amenable to that. Right. So that is where the, the, the difficulty is going to come. Mm. It's 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 a time when all when a lot of new models are going to happen. It's a time when the world is going to change. The business models are going to change, and many of the legacy organizations in this country might not be able to serve uh, of the best legacy organizations in this country uh, and around the world may not survive, and yeah. that just breaks my heart. And that goes for, by the way, education. You know what about? What about uh, higher education in America? And that's another frighteningly troubled uh, institution. I mean, we know that, you know, uh, Harvard, Columbia, Princeton, Stanford um, will all be around because their endowments are so massive. But what about uh, what about a normal school? You know, forget it. You know, well, you know, it's 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 it, it's danger zone right now. Danger zone. Yeah. And um, on a related topic, uh, you also had an op-ed a couple of years ago about the uh, public television uh, in the U.S. And, uh, and uh, I found it very interesting, uh, Bill, that you talked about the German public television mm -hmm. and how different mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would love to hear from you. You know, this was a couple of years ago. Do you, <laughs> uh, I would imagine things have gotten worse in the U.S. Uh, I would love to hear... Uh, your thoughts on it? Well, uh, yeah, it's interesting too that you were able to spot that article I did uh, about the Tagesschau, the uh, uh, German uh, program on uh, ARD, the one of the German networks. Um, it, you know, it's interesting. Well, well let me talk about uh, Germany and public media in Germany. It's, uh, after World War II, um, uh, it was decided that if Germany was going to exist, uh, they needed to use the media better, and it was really the Americans and the Brits that came up with the idea of, of really having them do a major 
fine public media. Well, yeah. the most publicly supported, the biggest budgets in public media, television and radio in the world, are in Germany. And with that kind of money, it's something like $10 billion a year in a country uh, 20% the size of the United States. Uh, in the United States, the government spends $400 million on public television. In Germany, it's over $10 billion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have television there and radio and journalism, uh, public television, radio, uh, and, and journalism that is impeccable. Uh, and because it takes money to do serious journalism and to do really high-quality television and radio programs. Well, they spend it. And it is so trusted in Germany yeah. by the German people that um, that even though you've seen audiences in America on television, like, new, you know, big newscasts. Remember when Walter Cronkite was in America, uh, half of the country used to watch that one newscast every night. So you had what, what we in the industry used to call a common campfire. <laughs> That, you know, that you'd come back to the office the next day and half of the people in the office had seen that newscast. So you had a common starting point, a framework to yeah. talk about issues of the day. Well, now audiences in America are so fragmented that, you know, if you get a uh, if you get a, 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 you know, a five or you know, 10 share right now, which means 10 percent of the people watching, you're a strong number one. Right. And um so and nobody even gets that. So TV audiences uh, uh, and radio have for, for many years been so fragmented that the audiences are relatively small. They're still because the country's so big, they're still in the millions. But it may be, you know, uh, our public t TV broadcast, our national public TV broadcast may only get a, uh, is a certainly under two million people in a country of over yeah. 330 million people. Wow. So uh, and, the, and, and that goes for the uh, commercial uh, people as well. So what happens? We have all this fragmented audience. We don't have it. Uh, people are all listening to stuff that they just want to believe themselves. So we have all these all these highly polarized people in America, whereas in Germany, they have um, people have such trust for their public media there, particularly that everybody watches it, huge percentage of people, and their audiences today are as big as they were 20 years ago, yes. even though they have as much competition in Germany as they do in the United States. So what does that say? Well, it says a lot of things. And, for, and so there, therefore, the German TV audience is the biggest in the world in news. It's about uh, 10, million, 10 million people. Too. Yeah, well, you know, compared to what we have, when you add all of our American newscasts together, yeah. Cable broadcasting, they don't even, you know, they they just, uh, they may be bigger because we're such a bigger country, but certainly not in share. Yeah. Uh, if you add all the shares of all of our audiences together, they don't come anywhere. Of all, you know, all the cable, the broadcast, et cetera, the public, the uh, commercial, they don't come anywhere near what the Germans have in one channel. Right. So, uh, you, you know, you, then you wonder why the country is doing so well. Well, it's obviously a strong public network, which is really helping him. So the idea that the Americans had after the end of the Second World War to rebuild Germany and the, and the Brits was a good one. They just didn't have the same idea for America itself, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So so what's the status quo for public uh, public media in general in the United States? Uh, the status quo for public media in general is worrisome. Um, uh, luckily, um, uh, every year the, uh, the governments have tried to cut back, uh, the, the government money that goes into public TV for uh, the last 10 years has been, uh, about $400 million TV and radio, all, but that's a huge, you know, infrastructure. You've got 350 public TV stations, a couple thousand radio stations. Um, so it doesn't go very far, uh, $400 million. So most of the money that goes into public media and public TV and radio in America is viewers and members like you, people making contributions. So that's why people like me, right. who were the president, who was the president of public TV in New York for 20 years, uh, they all recognized me as a guy with my hand out begging for money all the time. It was pretty uh, difficult, and that's what it is. And people have now started reaching exhaustion, you know, because so many people need money. And, yeah. you know, they figure, well, public TV and radio will be around, you know, et cetera. And that may not be the case. So 
what will happen is, is it won't disappear. It'll be eaten away, eaten alive, you know, so it'll just get weaker and weaker and weaker. That's what happened. That's what's happened in general in the media in America, whereas the Germans, uh, using my old example, have maintained huge government support, huge amounts of money. That has not gone down in America. Probably the funding on all levels will start creeping down. Certainly underwriting has disappeared, meaning, you know, commercial, it's quasi commercial support. And um, when you just don't have money, you just can't make great TV and radio. It's that simple. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to just switch gears and you know, briefly touch on, you made a movie also, Bill, it's called Sacred. Mm -hmm. And I haven't watched the movie, but uh, I find the the the, the topic uh, really fascinating. So it explores faith from around the globe, examining religious rituals from birth to death. Uh, could you could you briefly uh, talk about it, a bit? Um, sure, Gil. Um, uh, the film ran uh, last a year ago, uh, December. It premiered on uh, national public TV. Uh, in before that, it was in theaters all over the world. Um, the idea was uh, was to um, to uh, make a movie. Uh, this is in my kind of retirement after public television, but make it for public TV. Uh, I'm a personal person of faith, and I find, uh, but in a very ecumenical way, and I find all faiths to be fascinating and interesting. But look at faith as uh, from a kind of uh, 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 ritualistic point of view. You know how people, how different people in different cultures and different parts of the world celebrate their religions, yeah. and celebrate. It's really how are people all over the world trying to get to God, uh, trying to uh, uh, to communicate with God. So. Um, uh, what I did was I, I thought, well, I'm going to make this movie. I had made a number of films before, so I had, you know, I had been president of public TV in New York for a long time. So I thought this will, again, I said, like the uh, Juilliard thing, well, this will be easy. Well, it wasn't at all. I mean, how do you take on a subject of that scale? Mm. Uh, we wind, wound up, I wound up hiring uh, Tom Lennon. Tom Lennon is, a, uh, is a, an Academy Award uh, uh, a filmmaker. Uh, so he, um, he came up with the idea of doing for the first time, hi, you know, in effect finding, for, because also if you deal with people in their religion and their faith, you just can't walk in with a crew from New York or Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, storm into their religion, you know, and expect to get anything, you know, people are going to be on the muscle. They're going to be upset. They, or whatever it might be, you know, I mean, they might be cooperative, but it's not going to be the same way as finding somebody who's part of that life and who is who knows so we uh so he wound up finding and hiring 40 different great filmmakers all over the world in the strangest places like including madagascar and places and celebrated had them celebrate the faith of uh, you know the major faiths of their community for example i didn't know madagascar the the uh the um uh, the uh Many of the citizens there, what they do is, is uh, they rebury all of their their ancestors. They have these big tombs, and they go into them every year and pull their uh, deceased relatives out and re re uh, uh, wrap them. They don't take they don't take the wrappings all the way off, but re wrap them and celebrate and have a drunken blast and put them back in the tomb. So uh, you know where they where they you know it, it's a way to say hey you know I really come from someplace you know. In this country, you kind of hide death. You hide the, <laughs> your past. You don't. You know, people used to uh, fifty years ago go and visit their aunt, their relatives' uh, funeral uh, 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 cemeteries. They don't even do that anymore. Right. So, um, so I think it's. I think there are a lot of really interesting and wonderful things. Of course, the the Catholic religion uh, all over the world is fascinating and uh, and somewhat different in different places, uh, particularly Eastern Europe, where we did some filming. There's the uh, uh, you know, there. You know, uh, there's. Uh, we were in a prison uh, with a couple convicts who were lifers there and were never going to get out, but they found God and uh, were, pre you know, became kind of uh, 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 preachers uh, in in the uh, pr this prison in Louisiana. Pretty fascinating. At any rate, it was it was a joy and a privilege to make the film, and um, 
And one of our professors at Juilliard did the audio, did the soundtrack. It was really quite powerful. It it uh, won a bunch of awards and was uh, and uh, and was uh, seen uh, in theaters all over the world. And we had a co-producer, a Japanese uh, public broadcasting co-producer, and we started out by following a uh, monk, Japanese monk. Oh. Uh, circling this, doing this thousand day walk yeah. uh, and basically not even eating toward the end, didn't eat anything. And, uh, and it became a way to kind of prepare himself for his life as a, a, a true uh, monk. Anyway, it was, it was really quite a beautiful film. Oh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to get a, get a view of that, uh, uh, Bill. So I want to jump into your, your latest book, uh, and it's called Organizations for People, Caring Cultures, Basic Needs, and Better Lives. This is truly a book about people and how uh, and why people matter uh, in an organization. So you say in the book, as a country, we are slowly losing the social human nourishment we require for our happiness and well-being. When managing uh, a large commercial broadcast business, I soon realized that when hiring a person, we are also hiring a family. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the premise of the book and and um, and really how you developed ideas? Sure, uh, Gil, and uh, this is an area that you know a lot about too. I know you uh, did some work in the same area. First, let me talk about a little bit about my academic background. Of course, I was a media person for my whole professional career, which was a long, which and still is, still going, uh, and that's been almost fifty years. And uh, uh, but when I was in uh, graduate school at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. Um, they had a really significant uh, school of industrial psychology there. And, uh, and I uh, thought probably I would not go into media because I was smart enough then to know that the chances of making it in media were pretty remote. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I thought I better have something else to do. And I thought, I love this area of industrial psychology and organizational behavioral. Why don't I get into that? Well, many of the studies back then were uh, there were doing studies, and you're uh, you're a scientist, so uh, this would <laughs> resonate with you. So the, a lot of the studies back then, the early studies in industrial psych, were um, were things like uh, they were all pretty much in factories. And yeah. uh, for example, uh, uh, AT and T, the original AT and T that was running Western Electric, making the telephones and all, when these huge uh, factories would, you know, do things like experiment by seeing, how, you know, if you turn up the lights real bright, do people work harder in the assembly lines and all, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. And uh, so they did a lot of those kinds of studies. They weren't brutal studies, but, you know, they, you know, times have changed and everything else. And, and I had kind of drifted away from industrial psychological research because I was a practitioner and honestly didn't know what I was doing anyway. And, uh, you know, I was kind of just feeling my way around. I, I was a, a fine television and radio producer, but I was, a, I think, a terrible manager. So, you know, I, it was all by observation that I, and I had a series of really bad bosses, so my observation wasn't very good either. I thought, mm -hmm. well, this is the way you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be a jerk. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so, uh, and I watched the movies. I mean, that's the way most of us learn yeah, how to yeah. be a boss. You know, you watch the movies and TV all wrong. Right. Uh, and uh, so... I teamed up. I, I, I wound up having a friend um, who was a full time working industrial psychologist, Michael, Dr. Michael O'Malley, who was at Yale at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, and and he started showing me the research. And I know this podcast deals a lot with research. Well, you cannot believe <laughs> how much research there is. I mean, truly scientific research in this field yeah. It has gone from. Well, what we were, what what we saw, you know, fifty years ago in the field of turning the lights up in the factory to uh, to uh, putting people in MRI machines and studying their brain waves and right. uh, and you know, I mean, very nuanced, highly complex uh, psychological and uh, and physiological research tied to leadership. Um, we wound up in in our new book, this book called Organizations for People. Michael did this part of the work. It was 
amazingly hard. We have 40 pages, 40 pages of footnotes, footnotes alone <laughs> of all of the research that we, uh, that we, you know, small print research that we, uh, citations for yeah, the research. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there's lots and lots and lots of it. And it all points to one thing. Michael and I, uh, 12 years ago, wrote our first book together <laughs> called uh, Leading with Kindness, yeah. which was also based on research. And it was, you know, what, this, what the title said, kind leadership. Uh, you, don't, you shouldn't be a killer boss. You know, it's, you know, that kind leadership really does work. And we can we proved it um, with research, uh, and this book is in a sense a follow up on that uh, yeah. with more recent research, with more that you know being kind and by by the way you have to be careful how you define kind. That doesn't mean being a doormat or a pushover or somebody that you know says yes to everything. Right. Uh, you know, th this is a person who is confident, has very high standards, you know, that, you know, uh, 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 gives very clear, um, uh, uh, instructions and is not afraid to fire people, but yet, uh, is not some kind of an insane killer. And, um, uh, and kindness varies from, uh, workplace to workplace. Everything has to fit in. And we study in this book, we studied 21 different companies and how they managed kind leadership and how they were successful as a result of that. So that's, that's what uh, what uh, organizations for people is all about. Yeah, yeah. Um, the one of the things I don't know if you deal with this in this book, Bill. One of the things I argued in my book uh, called Flexibility in two thousand nine, and I want to get your perspective on it. Uh, one of the things I argued was it appears that women leaders are better managing very complex systems, so large companies, countries. Uh, and I argued that that's because, you know, even from an evolutionary perspective, uh, women always dealt with more complex, uh, complex systems where men had more of a process view. Mm -hmm. And um, and you can see, you know, in the latest COVID uh, situation, uh, countries led by women seem to have done exceptionally, exceptionally well. So Germany, New Zealand, Taiwan are examples of this where large countries uh, led by, you know, more, let's say, uh, macho men uh, appear to have done less well. Do you have a do you have a view on that? Well, my view is you're absolutely right. And it's interesting because as a sidebar, we covered that a little bit in our yeah. books, but I'm glad you did it. We, you and I should team up because <laughs> one of the things I say in speeches whenever I do that, and I haven't been doing many speeches lately, is that somehow or another in my just my personal life experience women tend to be better bosses than men yeah. and i don't know what all the reasons are you know certainly the matriarchy uh thing uh you cited some of the rational reasons why that would be the case that you know that they're used to uh, part of uh genetically have had to deal with more complex issues yeah uh you know more balls in the air etc right. uh and i agree with it that's why in the um, in this organizations for people book i asked rachel moore rachel moore uh, and i mentioned her earlier um uh, rachel moore uh, started out as a ballet dancer mm -hmm. uh, uh wanted to become was apparently a very good one went to new york broke her ankle uh she was in the corps de ballet so that's the end of that career at age 25. Uh -huh. This is a number of years ago. Couldn't get into college because yeah. nobody wanted a 25-year-old freshman. Somehow she did. She got into Brown, graduated, I think, top of her class, then went to either, I think, Columbia or Harvard uh, Business School and did phenomenally well there. Came back, ran the ran the ballet, turned it around economically, mm -hmm. and now is running the second or third biggest performing arts center in America, the Music Center of Los Angeles, five theaters, symphony, the whole thing, two thousand employees. One of the most gifted managers I've ever seen, but also a kind manager. Yeah. You know, she's she's, uh, and that's the other secret, is uh, and and honestly, women often are kinder than men. There must be there's something about hey, to be a, a strong man, you've got to be a tough, nasty guy. Well, that's not true, but many people, especially bosses, tend to think that. 
Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, she just wants to get the job done. She wants to treat people fairly and honestly. She is an incredible, I, I, to me, one of the finest executives in America. So to answer your question, what research we've seen in that field, you've even seen more, it sounds like, proves that that's the case. And just my personal life experience yeah. pro proves that that's the case. So uh, so I think um, we, have, we have a flag to wave here, and uh, we, we'd better do it. Yeah, yeah. I would love to collaborate on that, though. Uh, the other aspect that you talk a lot about in the book, which I, which I fully agree with, is really the caring culture aspect of a successful organization. And, you know, uh, I have very fond memories of a company called Hewlett Packard Company in the early 90s, uh, where I was uh, only for six months in between my business school years as an intern. And it was a very distinct culture that everybody sat together in a big factory floor. Uh, they were, you know, it's kind of removing the hierarchy that we came to expect in companies completely. It was very engineering driven company, obviously, hmm. uh, but it was culturally very egalitarian uh, and just, you know, just a joy to be uh, in the company. And so, from a you know sort of a diagnostic perspective, in my book I had you know kind of have a diagnostic kit. You know, if you go to a company and you say, "I want to see where this company is in terms of its its culture, its evolution," there there are a few quick things you can look at, and it's all people related and, and structure related, and you can quickly see how the how the company operates. And and you have talked about this in this book that you know it's easy to do short-term things is easy to show performance in the in the short run uh, but it's much more difficult in the very long run right absolutely i mean and that's one of the problems with i think particularly american business that it is all directed towards quarterly uh, uh quarterly performance and uh, and your eye gets off the ball for the long term and that's why some of the greatest companies have unfortunately been pushed away uh the companies that we need needed the most in america um the early and original at&t is an example there are just you know my old corporation i was president of television for westinghouse electric company yeah. they were you know a truly great uh company in uh, many uh, in many ways um my friend warren gibson dr warren gibson who was the co-author of the uh, performance book that we did uh uh, 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 the book we did about uh, uh, the world's your stage for uh, for Juilliard and yeah. uh, Fordham. Um, he uh, ran an engineering and was an owner, a founder of an engineering company, a small one in California. And he said his main goal was to treat people right mm -hmm. and to treat people fairly. Well, he was phenomenally successful. He said his original uh, funder. Uh, he didn't have a lot of money when he was graduating from uh, engineering school in Cleveland. Uh, his aunt uh, made some investment, and uh, he he came back, he told me, five years later, and gave her um, a return on her investment, which was 60 times, six zero times the <laughs> amount of money she invested. Yeah, yeah. And he was very proud of that and uh, felt very good about it. I said, well, what did she say? She said, he said, well, she said, thank you. <laughs> 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 That's the best thank you can give. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, you so know, at any rate, you're right, Gil, and uh, uh, and uh, and I and I wish we would do more of that. And I think your two examples are good. You know, right now, the world's arguably the world's best leader is uh, is uh, 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 is Andrea Merkel. You know, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> So also, Bill, in the book, um, you, you mentioned some statistics. 36% uh, of the employees say they have dysfunctional managers, and 75% of workers say their boss is the most stressful part of the job. I find these numbers uh, really amazing. Um, and, and, and this is what's happening. So you, you had talked about you know, the, the, the small engineering company out in California. It seems to me, I haven't really thought about this, Bill, but it seems to me that uh, tech technology-driven companies in the 70s and 80s were really good companies because I think their culture was more egalitarian, I think, right? 
Correct. I think that is right. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. And we seem to have, you know, sort of drifted away from it. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you probably know more about this than I do. The, you know, the financial institutions, uh, you know, the large consulting companies, you know, they tend to be highly competitive. Uh, they tend to be very much, you know, economics focused companies. So as the as the economy change, when we take a cross section of the companies from the from the whole economy, uh, I guess we get you know we get numbers like uh, like you have in the book. Yes, let me give you a few more numbers. You cited two numbers that yeah. are in our book, but uh, a recent Canadian study, meaning about less than a year old, two out of five people on the, this study said they would quit. Said that they had quit their jobs because of bad bosses. Two out of five Canadians. Yeah. Uh, uh, in 2015, NBC did a poll that said most people would forego a 10% raise uh, uh, in salary in right. exchange for a kinder boss. And uh, and most all of the studies, uh, and there are, there's lots of new research that has just come out dealing with kindness, yeah. Uh, say, uh, say uh, you know, they ask people all these questions about what are the things that are most important to you, uh, you know, money and this and that. And, uh, you know, uh, so uh, the studies all showed when asked 34 different qualities that you could have in a company and a friend uh, and a romantic partner and a boss and an employee, the yeah. number one the number one factor kept coming up kindness. So that's what we want. You know, that's what our, that's what, uh, what the wiring of our psyche requires. Yeah. And that's what we are not getting. That's why this, the feeling of particularly America and other parts of the Western world, the, uh, the, the, the behavior uh, and our own intrinsic needs are in a pol our polar opposites right now. Right. Right. Do you see, um, I know that, you know, you deal with um, students in Juilliard as well. Do you see a difference uh, between our generation and the next generation in terms of their orientation in this dimension? I do. Um, uh, at least the students I see now, again, I'm in a distorted environment. So, you know, I don't, you know, I mean, uh, Fordham is less distorted, I, I presume. But certainly Juilliard is very distorted, very unusual and different kinds of people. Yeah. But I, the people I see uh, at both, uh, both of those schools is that they want kindness, that they're willing to forego. It's not about money anymore. It's about, hey, uh, so I'm, I've got a feeling that they, that the students that we see today, the young people that we see today, have seen their parents beaten to death by this mm. economy. And they're saying, hey, there's, there's got to be something better out there than this. And that's what they're looking for. I really sense that. I really feel that. So I have, because of our young people, not because of the other people <laughs> that are around, but because yeah. of our young people, I see hope. I, I see hope. I, I have hope. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think, I think we got caught in you know, a, an objective function that is, that is you know, very, for lack of a better term, noisy. Uh, you know, there were some studies that show that happiness uh, against income, for example, uh, is an inverted U function. Yes. Um, in the U.S., it's around 65000 70000 or something like that. Uh, but I have met nobody who wants to stop at 70000 <laughs> So <laughs> once you're on top of the hill, right. your tendency is to run down that hill and go as far as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an incredible thing, you know, if you if you have the ability to kind of step back and say, how do I optimize happiness, right? That's right, yeah, I, I do, I really think, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, um, I was just talking to a friend of mine, um, I don't think he'd m m bother if I mentioned his name, and that's yeah. Mark Thompson. Yeah. Mark Thompson is the just retired president of the New York Times. Uh, he's been he's done that for probably the past 10 years. Before that, he was the head of the BBC. He's a he's British, very smart, very fine, 
fine human being, a uh, brilliant leader. Um, he could do anything he wants right now. He, he, re he retired kind of young. Uh, he did very well economically. And he said he's been offered many more leadership jobs, but now he's thinking, hey, I, what, I, what good can I do? It has nothing to do with making money. What good? And I told him that uh, one of the things I said, because I'm a little ahead of him, a lot ahead of him in age, I said that uh, I have found uh, right now in my life Helping younger people, by younger people, I mean, in this case, students that have graduated, recently graduated from college or in graduate school, uh, 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 succeed in their careers. I find great joy from that. You know, it's not that I don't need career success. I had whatever that brings back back when yeah. now i'd lo i love to see and help others succeed and there's a lot of value that comes from that personal value you know that you, you get more than they get when you do that so um so again i see hopefulness because of, i see some of these young people who have their values are willing to do it um i've had uh, i have a scientist relative a close relative who's a scientist yeah. who um was ordered by his by his uh, employer. Uh, he has a PhD in geology, uh, not to talk about uh, global warming and that kind of stuff. <laughs> so he said he couldn't yeah. do that, and he quit his job. You know, at great great sacrifice. Right, right, right. Yeah. So in conclusion, Bill, you know, if you look forward five years, you have diagnosed some of these issues that we see inside uh, companies uh, in, in in larger chunks of societies. Uh, do you see some policy type interventions that you you might think about to 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 let's say uh, get on the right track? Um, I'm sure there are. Uh, I'm I'm sure there are. I mean, I think a lot of it is going to have to be education, you know. Yeah. But I mean, but uh, I, I think we have, in many respects, in America, pretty good pretty good uh, policies. We don't. I don't want to overkill. Uh, you know, add paperwork to doing the right thing. Right. Uh, and I also don't want people, because when you have kind of formal policies, very often those tend to be manipulated too. Yeah, I yeah. think it's got to start coming from more and more from the heart. Where does that come from? It comes from uh, uh, everything from uh, religion to philosophy to, uh, to family values that, uh, that lead to doing the right thing. So I think among other things, good example of the kind that, say, Mark Thompson has when, uh, when uh, as leader of the New York Times when he did that, of, you know, of people like Rachel Moore, uh, who leads a great performing arts institution. These people will be, uh, I hope, honored, followed, and I think they're the ones that, that, that give us hope that, by good example, that doing the right thing really does pay off. And it pays off even at the bottom line, even at the bottom line. And, and, and one could say sometimes, especially at the bottom line, they, you, know, they know. So um, uh, there's, there is hope here. And the kinds of studies and science that's going into the kind of research that you've done already in, in your book that hopefully uh, Dr. Michael O'Malley and I are doing in ours and our work, uh, you know, we're picking away at this and hopefully we'll get somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this has been great, Bill. Uh, really appreciate the time that you spend with me. And uh, good luck with, uh, with, uh, with all the stuff that you do. Well, Gil, thank you. Thank you for finding me and, uh, and uh, celebrating our books uh, and our thinking uh, on your uh, wonderful podcast. I hope we may stay in touch. So uh, you take care and uh, onward and upward. <laughs> Thanks so much, Bill. Thank you. Bye.